Hello everyone, I'm Oniden and uh, today I want to present some uh, brief overview of uh, deep neural networks. Uh, first, uh, what is deep learning? Uh, deep learning is uh, a hierarchical representation learning of uh, some functions or uh, using the uh, hierarchical uh, representation for some uh, inputs. To classify the to classify the input based on their feature, the higher uh, the the representations are hierarchical and the complexity will increase uh, hierarchically. In in this way, we can uh, learn uh, more complex uh, functions. Or for the classification purpose, uh, we will have uh, more general and relevant uh, features in the final layers and uh, we will remove the uh, detailed and uh, irrelevant uh, features in the uh, earlier layers. Uh, as you can see from the picture, uh, uh, for, for example, image recognition, uh, the, the rough, uh, the rough, uh, Deep learning roughly works uh, like this. Uh, in the first layer, we have the pixels as an input. Uh, mm, the second layer, the first hidden layer, we will detect the edges. After that, in the second layer, uh, second layer, second hidden layer, we will uh, detect the object parts, and finally, in the third layer, we will uh, detect the object, the whole object. Or uh, for NLP purpose, uh, we will have different uh, kind of hierarchies. For example, for image recognition, uh, roughly speaking, we can say that in the input we have a pixel. After that, we will detect the edges. After that, text sound, mo motif, part, and object. Or uh, for the text, character, word, word group, class, sentence, and a story. Uh, similarly, for a speech recognition, we have a hierarchy, uh, hierarchical representation. So, if I have a uh, uh, structured text, uh, sorry, unstructured text but uh, kind of edited, meaning well written text, right? Mm -hmm. Could I supply to the system a valid grammar? Um, you want to have a uh, Syntactical grammar of the sentence? Language syntax grammar. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, for that, uh, they use the recursive uh, tensor neural networks. Uh, so it is like the parse theory, but uh, it is the neural network with the structure of the parse theory. So uh, the input to this uh, neural network is the board. And after that, they try to find the parse, parse theory that is the, the uh, most proper parse theory for this sentence. So, uh, let me give most specific example. So, in a uh, lot of NLP, there is a linguistic approach where people would write rules, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, suppose in certain domain, the rules are already written. So, I want to use deep learning but use existing rules uh, that humans have written to further enhance the understanding. Mm -hmm. So how would I do that? How would I incorporate? And you don't have to answer this. You can answer this later once you have introduced more things. But that's something I'm interested in. Yeah. So I want to uh, investigate various ways of incorporating knowledge. The knowledge can be in the form of rules, syntactic parts, uh, things, uh, uh, so, uh, what is it called? BNP grammar, whatever the BNF. BNF grammar. No, but, but I, I think, think uh, see, right now most of the work uh, is done using unlabeled uh, thing, right? So, what you're suggesting is I'm going to add additional features and the later layers can exploit that. Yes. So, yeah. I need to appropriate, you know, obviously uh, in the text, once you have the clauses, how the clauses get uh, used in the uh, correct uh, creation of sentence. Or once your sentence, how I'll break the clauses so that I know that the 
constitutes are the more interesting ones, the right ones. Right. No, for example, just think about the the, the edge example that she gave, right? Mm. So you could, uh, instead of making it discover the edges, you can give it on platter saying there is a vertical edge, there is a horizontal edge and then subsequent layers can exploit it. So Right, but I'm more interested in saying that I already have recognized these objects and the objects have whatever features are already there. So, um, uh, there are several objects that I already have, just like I've done supervision, uh, supervised training. Right, right. And I want the system to exploit that. Yeah, I, I think and it should mean be. different things, in different right. cases. In the other case, I want to exploit, um, uh, you know, um, a, uh, a training that I may have already done on the speech of a particular person. In other case, or particular, you know, somebody in Indian accent. In other case, I want to explore, you know, to find out a way to uh, utilize the geo names. Right. So, I, 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 I think given that we are forcing it to discover features and now you are saying I'm going to give some on the platter is actually a very wise thing to do and I think we should be able to incorporate mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Uh, why not deep? Uh, the first uh, reason that people use deep learning is uh, uh, we can uh, overcome the need uh, uh, to manual feature engineering. Uh, the, uh, the traditional classifiers that we have all have uh, a manual feature engineering. It, it means that uh, human should, uh, should uh, analyze the data and decide about uh, decide uh, which uh, features are important and we should incorporate them into into the model. But in deep learning, we have a large set of data set, uh, a data set, uh, a very uh, big data set, and uh, we use the samples and uh, and give them to uh, fit them into the deep learning uh, structure to uh, and uh, the and the deep learning system. Uh, would uh, learn the features by itself. And uh, they work very well in vision, audio, and in and NLP, the breakthrough in speech recognition in 2009, and also computer vision in 2012. Early in 2015, a machine was able to beat the human for the first time for the object recognition. And uh, they are also very successful for machine translation that is very uh, difficult, uh, especially in terms of the feature engineering because uh, a domain expert should consider all the features of the source language and also the target language and think how we should align them uh, to do the um, effective machine tra translation. So since it is learning the features are in unsupervised manner, once it learns the features, can human interpret such features? Mm -hmm. uh, for some of, uh, it depends uh, on the model and also the application. For example, for com uh, convolutional neural network, uh, for image, it is uh, very easy to interpret the each, each layer result. But uh, for an NLP, for example, convolutional neural network, for NLP, it's not, but it uh, still works very well. But uh, to interpret the result of a particular area, it doesn't mean that's the feature that it learned, right? It means, uh, for example, uh, consider that for a convolu uh, deep convolutional neural network, uh, what uh, they are doing is uh, applying some filters, um, the window of filters that is a matrix to the uh, to the image and uh, go go through the neural network. Um, after the um, after uh, training, if uh, you see the matrix that is learned, for example, uh, it is. Uh, Mm, almost the same uh, the same matrix that we use for edge detection, for example, in the first layer, and in the second layer for the contour detection for image processing. Or uh, there is uh, one another model, attention-based neural network. They use attention-based neural network uh, to interpret them, translate. Uh, uh, 
language uh, machine translation for uh, for NLP machine translation for language. And uh, it is like this: after uh, they, they can uh, use the result of attention neural network to see for each um, result that uh, they would get. Uh, which uh, part of the neural network is uh, activated more? Uh, for example, if uh, if uh, I, if uh, the translation for the first word from the source language is uh, some part of the sentence in the target language, both will uh, will be activated more than other the features. Both uh, both of mm, that areas in the sentences. Actually, um, uh, so I mean, we can we get any kind of analysis over the future things, like which feature, which feature, how um, students learn? Um, uh, for example, uh, in uh, for which country? In uh, what, whatever we have after the pre-training of a deep uh, neural network is a feature. But it is a uh, it is a real valued feature. It is full of the valued numbers. So uh, whatever we have is a feature, but uh, interpreting uh, of them are not easy. It's not easy. Uh, neural networks are loosely inspired by bi biological neural network and uh, also our brain, but uh, I want to as, uh, highlight that it is uh, loosely inspired, so it's not um, it's not completely like our brain or our neural system, our nervous system. Uh, for example, we use the activation function that is uh, in sigmoid uh, most of the time on neural network, but it's not. It is only one uh, function that we use it because the derivation of uh, we, the, uh, we can drive it is uh, the drive it uh, drive that easily using the uh, function itself. Mm. I extracted uh, this part from uh, Likon's uh, keynote. So I just uh, want to make a interesting side comment. You know, there is a lot of um, discussion on uh, human and machine inter you know collaboration, working them together, right, to solve more complex problems rather than machine alone or human alone. Right, the benefits of that we have seen that. And I'm wondering what is the analogy here, in that uh, humans have created some knowledge, collective intelligence, Wikipedia, we extracted things from that. So that those kind of knowledge represent what humans have, uh, you know, already contributed, you know, understanding for that domain. And well, that is indirect way, or some other direct way, a human could be involved in uh, further improving. So now, there are some things here where deep learning is already giving excellent results. There are a number of things that, if I'm, my, my understanding is that a number of things have to happen. The size of the data set, the coverage, quality, all those things given. In some of these cases, the results are already out of the box with the right technology in deep learning are very, very good. What we'll be interested in are complex uh, a little bit more esoteric problem. So, um, if you try and compare a, a task of understanding images, the images are already there, or labeling images, okay? it's not easy, it's hard, but it's done reasonably well with some of these technologies. And yet, trying to understand medical text that doctors submitted with a lot of indirect and implicit mentions with a um, uh, lot of, uh, you know, so the, the, it is possible that the data by itself is not sufficient in part. There may be multiple things that could be uh, lacking in being able to develop out-of-the-box good deep learning solution, based solution. Right? 
So some of the conditions are not the same. The data coverage is not very good. Uh, different doctors write differently the same thing. Um, uh, the annotation, the understanding expresses in the form of annotation may be not well defined or very unique for that particular domain. Uh, so you, for example, I come up with the fact that I come up with the requirement that my target needs to be this way of representing medical knowledge. Now, it is one thing that you run deep learning on a large corpus and you come up with a um, intelligent uh, results identifying a cat in the video, which is a general common purpose thing. I mean, it's a very generic task of recognizing an object in a video. Vis-a-vis -vis something that is highly specific to that domain, that it needs to fit in this hierarchy, this mode of thinking in medical field. And hence, unless there is some way you control the way you know abstractions are created and high level is created, it's not going to map to the way you want. So this, this is just one of the examples where out of the box solution won't, can't, won't I, I don't see how it will happen. So, those are the kind of problems that would be particularly interesting to us. Where we will be able to um, specify the specific target in how the solutions should come up, the domain specific. In the process, we are going to infuse with knowledge or we are going to provide certain knowledge uh, so that the, what you call, search space, or you might, might call it is you know pruned to one that is relevant to our problem solving and not just anything else and it can't be done without additional input it is simply not possible to do by data and uh, mathematical you know smart processing right so those are the kind of stuff that we should look for and you know uh, and i think those are the kind of problems we will have and i think that will be a unique opportunity to our group team so then, can I ask a question? So is, this is un, un, an unsupervised thing. You don't you don't give it any feedback or or cat because I mean, we have uh, unsupervised, unsupervised, and supervised. So well, when it's supervised, can't you give it a classification? Can't is is there some way to impose some structure on the learning process? No. Yeah. What are uh, the supervised in deep learning? Yeah. 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 Like so what? that would. Uh, Mm, with supervised, I mean, uh, we have a label data, yeah. but uh, the input and label data. Mm. We don't uh, we give the feature as an input. Mm. The samples are the input to the. So would labeling it yeah. solve your problem? No, I, th I think maybe we should take uh, it this way. I, I think the reason why they are making a big deal about deep learning is because you can do a lot with the unsupervised learning, and that's the key. Mm, that's the key. So, so once we, so, so there are actually things even in NLP context that we can actually do using unsupervised mm -hmm. and which was a surprising uh, thing. But I'm just trying to respond can, to what Amit said, yeah, which is how, can you, upon, yeah. how can you add some structure? Is there an opportunity to add structure yeah, or absolutely. guide the process? And so that's why I asked about right. supervised So you see, uh, what, what, what I try to do also is kind of redefine the problem and make the problem more domain specific and complex yeah. compared to you know, a lot of data and standard results yeah. kind of thing that you expect for any intelligent human. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, deep learning is based on the statistical data and the, the samples and the labels that we have for the data. So uh, whenever our data is not uh, sufficient to uh, predict something, for example in the medical domain, so uh, we should uh, use background knowledge also. Uh, uh, this is what uh, Lekun says about uh, deep learning. Uh, he, he, he says that let's be, uh, not be, let's be inspired by nature, but not too much. Uh, we should decide uh, which details are important for us when we study the human brain and uh, nervous system. For example, for airplane, the airplane uh, in, 
we don't have uh, wing flapping or we don't have the feather, but it uh, still works. So it's not uh, exactly similar to the bird, but it works. So uh, we should uh, understand what is equ equivalent of aerodynamics that uh, that is inspired by the uh, bird for uh, constructing the airplane to understanding the intelligence. And they use uh, this uh, Loose inspired, uh, loosely inspired biological system that uh, the mammalian visual cortex is uh, hierarchical. Um, it is uh, hierarchical in the sense that when uh, we see something with, uh, through our retina, so, uh, then it will go to other uh, layers in our uh, hierarchical layer in our brain. So first of all, we have the simple visual form like edges and uh, uh, corners, then intermediate visual, visual forms, features, groups, and finally we have high level object uh, descriptions, faces, and but I'm, I'm guessing that in our brain, at some level, uh, we are associated using other knowledge, like uh, what we understand uh, samples of apple that I have seen over the period of time, and uh, its analysis and then it's represented, you know, uh, that I'm using. Meaning I'm using the knowledge or experience yeah. in the process, which is not shown here. Yeah, that's why. The other thing is, at some level in the perception cycle, I feel confident enough to label it now. That this is apple and not, not tomato. Right? That is not represented here. It is those kind of opportunities that we need to be able to uh, look for and, and bring it. Can, can you help me out with these two pathways of visual representation, the dorsal pathway and the ventral pathway? Can you reconstruct that stuff? It, look, it looks like there's two pathways of visual representation. I don't know a lot about this, but there's two pathways. One has to do with um, sort of the the the, the perception action pathway, and another has to do with this labeling categorization pathway. There's, there's, and I don't remember which is which. Do you? No, it's the what and the where. Yeah, it's the what and the where. These are these are two different pathways. It looks like we only have one of them going on. Yeah. The, the other yeah. thing is that uh, the point I'm trying to make is that those pathways, the multiple pathways, and they intersect. Yes. And those kind of opportunity again. Are the ones that we and, and that is just so critical yeah. um, for human capability. Yeah, is understanding how they inter intersect. Yeah. Uh, so uh, all models are wrong, but uh, <laughs> some are useful. So deep learning, whatever it is, is uh, very useful, and uh, we should come up with uh, other ideas to combine it with uh, deep learning to make it more useful. Uh, now, uh, I want to give an uh, overview of uh, neural networks. As you know, we have uh, some inputs, and uh, in the input layer, one hidden layer in the traditional neural networks, and uh, finally the output layer uh, that can have one output or many outputs. Uh, so, uh, why now uh, deep learning is so hard? Uh, uh, although we had the uh, neural networks from uh, many times ago. Uh, first of all, it is uh, because of vanishing gradient problem. Uh, it is uh, because uh, when we have uh, many hidden layers in the deep learning, uh, it, uh, as you know, we have uh, feed forward pass in the neural network and back, uh, backward pass, uh, pass in the neural network, that is the uh, back propagating error to uh, the hidden layers. So do you get a, a do you get a what, what are the techniques of uh, defining the error? That, you know, uh, is there you know in back propagation the error right? Yeah. Uh, what are the ways that you can actually define the errors? I and mean, what 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 have been done there? The most uh, standard way of uh, defining error is the difference between the target's uh, output and the actual output. But intermediate uh, output layers are not recognizable by humans too well, right? So, how do you do that? 
How do they do that? No, you you can still the back propagation actually just propagates the errors how do you, through that. How do you how do you how do you measure the error? How do you specify the error? So, so you, you just connect. I mean, because of that derivative or whatever the calculus they have, they tell you exactly how to propagate it in the best uh, possible way to all the way to the beginning. But what is the error function and how do you? So the error you function at the very function. end that you so so at the end you know that. You, you basically have the target value and the value that you generate. Mm. And from there to, to you basically find the gradient and, and say that if you go in this direction, you will be able to but reduce to the... You say what is the target value would be key to giving a, a training set. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, so you yeah. have to train it, right? Yeah. You have to train it, is, it initially. It is super wise. So, super we have exactly. the input, <laughs> that is uh, our instrument, <laughs> the output, uh, the output that the neural network generates. So how do you manage to create a limited uh, given the No, that is that unsupervised thing, right? Like for example, the word and its context, right, is just out there for the asking on the web. So that's what we use for the NLP thing. So you don't create any corpus. You just say that take the document that is on the web and look at the window of 10 words. So the word and the plus five words after and plus five words before they are the correlated words and yeah, just but, use that. Let's say this data on the web is written by so many different people. Exactly, and that's, that's why it is surprising that this uh, works and the word to work has been successful and the claim to fame is the fact that you take these uh, lots and lots of these documents and everything evens out and, and that's the claim. And so if two things mean the same thing then they still appear in the company or similar words. Uh, let me tell you something. Uh, we have uh, supervised learning. Uh, this as uh, the traditional neural network is a supervised learning. So we have an instance label, uh, the label that neural network pre uh, predict for us, the actual label, and the uh, error is the difference between the actual label and the predicted label. Uh, 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 using some uh, mathematical functions like mean squared error and uh, like. But uh, for word to work and uh, other kinds of uh, autoencoder neural networks that we have, this is like this. We have the, in the input, we have uh, the sample that we have, for example, a uh, word and its context. And in the output, we try to generate the input again. And the error is the similarity of, uh, the dissimilarity of the input and the output. So it is the reconstructing the input in the output layer again, in the unsupervised uh, autoencoder neural networks. So as far as we use uh, backpropagation, we have a vanishing gradient problem because uh, we uh, backpropagate the error through many hidden layers and in the early layers uh, gradient would be very low and uh, the, the learning rate and the step that uh, we uh, take to the uh, actual uh, result is, uh, would uh, become less and less so the, uh, time, uh, the time for training would be uh, very uh, long and uh, the training uh, would uh, slow down. Um, now, the uh, Hinton has solved it in 2006 by proposing uh, restricted Boltzmann machine instead of backpropagation. And we have uh, lots of data uh, today, so they, um, they are very useful uh, for training a big uh, neural network with many hidden layers. And GPUs uh, uh, are also very important because uh, training uh, neural networks uh, takes uh, mounted uh, bit CPUs. Uh, so the first solution to vanishing gradient problem is a restricted Boltzmann machine. Uh, in the restricted uh, uh, a restricted Boltzmann machine is a shallow neural network. It's not deep. Uh, we have a visible units uh, 
in the input layer and hidden units in the hidden layer. And the neural network tries to reconstruct the input, uh, the, in, uh, the input in the hidden units. It is like this. You have the input in the visible, visible layer, then uh, the neural network try to encode them to some numbers in the output layer and again reconstruct them in the vis visible layer and uh, based on the similarity of uh, what it can construct, uh, we will uh, we will learn the weights here and these weights would be a feature for the a bigger neural network that we will use reconstructed Boltzmann machine in them. So instead of uh, doing back propagation, we will use recepted Boltzmann machine that will not have a vanishing gradient problem. Recepted Boltzmann machine are kind of autoencoders uh, that are uh, feature extractor neural networks. So um, again, we have input. Uh, we will encode them to some uh, numbers, like the translating them into uh, some numbers, and then we try again to reconstruct the re reconstruct the input from that number. So the input and output should be very similar. And in this uh, way, doing the, that multi in multiple steps, uh, we will re reconstruct the input in the output, and we will use this code as a feature for uh, some other uh, neural networks. So uh, it is like the feature extractor. We will have a feature here. Uh, these numbers will show the most important uh, features of our data. It is uh, unsupervised. Uh, it tries to detect inherent patterns in the data and in an unsupervised manner. So they are very good for real world problems and we can use uh, them both shallow and deep. For example, uh, word 2 vec is uh, one example of uh, shallow uh, autoencoders because it has only three lines. Uh, deep learning for NLP. Uh, the most important... So good. What's not used for NLP also is uh, for image. Uh, deep belief networks. Uh, I know uh, they are mostly used for image process, image recognition, but I'm not sure that uh, they are not applied to NLP also. But they are not uh, popular for deep mm -hmm. for NLP. But autoencoders, uh, we will use autoencoders for uh, learning uh, word embeddings or vectors. Uh, the most uh, important difference uh, between the traditional NLP and uh, the NLP that <coughs> use deep learning is using vectors. Uh, in the, when we want to use uh, deep learning for NLP, the input to the neural network would, uh, would be a, a dense, low-dimensional vector that we have uh, learned before from the unsupervised data, the big data set that we have. There are two uh, different models to do that, to learn the, this uh, dense, low-dimensional vectors. Uh, continuous bag of words and a speedgram model, two uh, popular tools, uh, uh, there are two popular tools to do that, both Tubek and uh, Gela. Another um, approach that uh, we can take is using a one-hot vector. One-hot vector is uh, the size of the vocabulary and uh, uh, each, uh, each word will be mapped to one uh, vo each place in the ve that vector would be mapped uh, to one word in the vocabulary, and it, uh, so the size uh, would be uh, it, it can be very large and sparse. How continuous bag of words uh, works? Uh, we have a con uh, for each word uh, we have a context word that is the window of uh, the neighborhood for that word. 
and uh, the neural network tries to uh, uh, the neural network tries to uh, as I told before uh, reconstruct the input uh, again and in this uh, reconstructing it will learn this these weights for uh, so for each board uh, we will have uh, one by n that that n is the number of uh, neurons in the hidden layer uh, vector for each board. So the result of the continuous bag of board would be 1 uh, times n uh, vector for each board that we will use it uh, for other uh, neural, for deep learning neural networks. A skip model is like continuous bag of board. Um, the only difference is that in the continuous bag of board we had a context board and we try to uh, predict the target board. It is like the filling the gap. Uh, we know the uh, we know the boards in the neighborhood of uh, this board, and we try to find it. Um, but in the skip graph model, we have the board, so we want to learn the context board. And again, uh, this part is important for us. We we will use uh, these uh, these uh, these uh, weights uh, as a vector uh, for the target board. So, um, yeah, um, here the input is what? Uh, here the input is the uh, each word in the data set. And it tries uh, to learn the context words. But it how it means because we don't see that in the neighborhood. No, no, no. Uh, we have a very <coughs> large uh, corpus, mm -hmm. so this word uh, will uh, occur with many words. So you fit uh, with the whole of the corpus. Yes, mm -hmm. but it is unlabeled. We only have the corpus and the coherence so, of words. So we can say here is word organizer. Uh, no. Because word organizers also one word by one word is getting from each uh, No, no, no. Consider, uh, I, I think... It's not uh, a word, word organizer. But here yeah. they want to capture the context. No, because it is word, right? No. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, consider this. So, please, this one. Uh, I have one sentence there. Mm, for example... And... Uh, with the one gap. I don't know that gap. Using the data set of uh, many uh, sentences that this word will occur in the different contexts, I, uh, uh, and feeding all the instances, uh, all the sentences to the input, I will try to uh, predict, the, uh, predict the word that should be on that uh, in that gap. Uh, for uh, how how we will do that uh, for making the vector for this board very similar to the vector in the context boards. And uh, after uh, making many iterations based on all the instances that we have in the data set, the weights that uh, the neural network uh, will learn would be the uh, word vector for that one. So is there some control on the, on the corpus to make the context similar? I mean, how do you handle words that have different meanings? Cool is hot. Huh? Cool is hot. Cool, cool is hot. Yeah, right. That's that's a, that's a good example. So it's not it's not always the case that a word means the same thing. It depends on the context. Look at so this dictionary that gives you different geolocated. Uh, yeah. ge ge you know. So where we so if you, but if you control the context, if you only have his his hip database, <laughs> then then you'll be okay. Mm. But if you have a mixture, then we have a mess. Or no? No, Maybe that's the claim. That, that's the claim that even when you have even that mess, mess, it still makes no because it's not really a mess. Because when you take a large corpus, it it still has some regularities which is learned by this. I mean, that is the so that's the surprising part. 
the people writing independently using similar words eventually when you have lots and lots of data the similarity actually shows up when you have lots of data if you have only a small piece of data it won't show up could that be an artifact of like class imbalance so if if amit if the database is composed of you know 10% of amit's hip language yeah, I mean, you can and always, 90% right. of regular language then then you'll get the regularity right so if if i have only 100 document it probably won't work if i have millions of document uh, developed independently it 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 they have shown that it seems to work well so so that's a surprising part that lot of chaos can actually have regularity that you can extract automatically like this. It sure is. <laughs> That's a surprising part. It's very yeah. surprising. Right. So, um, uh, one more is uh, asking um, the categories. Yeah. Um, uh, so, is like, is it like habit modeling because you categorize different? Categories. No, no, there isn't any uh, categorization. It is, uh, we have uh, one word in the input. I try to find the context words in the output. It is like this. That word uh, will but utter. Word, you said that it's uh, occurring in which other context? In which context? So it, uh, the, the result would be like this. The, the input, the numbers in the input, should be very, uh, what I mean by the input is the uh, weights in the hidden, hidden value. Only, uh, if you can show them that you uh, are a Michigan, that, that application, web application. The way we... Yeah. Which one? W-E-V-I. The one uh, Yeah, but it is a video. No, 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 there's a... Uh, no, there's a URL, we can play around. I think we can send it later on. Oh, yeah, you, yeah. You can play around with it. Yeah, that then, um, yeah, I would send you... But so, so just, so just so I understand, so if the target word was dog, it will output things like pet and... and no, no, no. What will, it, what, will, what, will, what context words will come uh, out? The context is the neighborhood words uh, in the corpus. For yeah. example, dog uh, will, be, will come with uh, which words before dog and which words Oh, after okay. Dog. So not concepts, but syntactic uh, features that would be related to dog, like walking no, and running or Even what? not the syntax, syntactic features. Okay. Uh, we have uh, one word as input. The output would be the words in the vicinity of that that word in the corpus. And okay. because we do uh, something like this, so for, uh, consider that dog and cat uh, would occur <coughs> in the similar context. Yes. Okay. So um, at the at the end after the whole, uh, whole training, the uh, vector for the dog mm -hmm. would be very similar to vector for cat because their context is, is very similar. Okay. So it is very similar. Mm -hmm. You have the example of queen and king? Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. And uh, it captures the similarity as good as, uh, for example, if you uh, uh, find uh, king, king vector minus uh, uh, Queen vector, it should be, it would be similar to woman, uh, man mm -hmm. minus uh, woman. So, yeah. for example, and there are many Okay. Actually, let me say it this way. So, so people who are interested, I mean, used to latent semantic indexing and things of that sort, mm -hmm. I think it is similar to the latent dimensions that you uh, discover where exactly. if a word appears in the company of similar words, then their uh, representation in the latent space, right? They are close, mm -hmm. and I think there are some papers that actually demonstrate a close connection the, between the, the matrix, uh, uh, LSA, LSI, those kinds of mm -hmm. techniques, and what this automatically learns in the hardware. Okay. So uh, then, uh, it's uh, interesting. Uh, the just a kind of contextual similarity. Uh, yes. Yeah. But because the data set is very big, so it captures this similarity very well. Mm 
deep belief net is another kind of uh, deep neural networks that uh, they use a stack of uh, restricted Boltzmann machines uh, that uh, we saw before. Uh, it is uh, in the structure. It is identical to multilayer perceptrons, so it is like this. But in terms of training, it is very different uh, because first of all, it uh, doesn't use um, back propagation. Uh, instead of that, it uses uh, restricted Boltzmann machines. Second, we have uh, two kind of training: first pre-training and uh, second fine tuning. In terms of uh, restricted Boltzmann machine, we had uh, restricted Boltzmann machine before. We had the uh, visible layer and hidden layer. We will stack them uh, together. So uh, here we have a visible hidden uh, hidden layer. This one would be a visible for another restricted Boltzmann machine, and the, again hidden layer until uh, to the end. Uh, the pre training is uh, like this. We will um, uh, use uh, restricted Boltzmann machine uh, to find the features. So at the end of uh, at the end after uh, training many times restricted Boltzmann machine, the bits on the uh, neural net, uh, neural networks would be the features of our data set. Again, we cannot uh, interpret them, but they are uh, very valuable to us. Then we will use point tuning. Point tuning is uh, now uh, uh, applying using the label data set that we have. So we have the features that are uh, trained, uh, that are learned unsupervised. After that, we will give the input uh, again to the neural network, and here we will have a fully connected neural network with the labels. It will uh, match. It will map the uh, features that uh, has learned so far to the labels. So in this way, we, will, uh, we could have a very a small label data set. Uh, and the fine tuning is uh, very short because the weights are sensibly good. Uh, so they will uh, alter uh, very less than, the, um, less than before. So we can use for fine, fine tuning back propagation. And we will not have any problem with vanishing gradient because uh, in, the, in several steps uh, our uh, our neural network will converge. So, uh, it has also reasonable training time and it is very accurate and mostly it will be used for image recognition. Uh, another kind of uh, deep learning is uh, convolutional uh, neural uh, networks. Uh, we can have a convolutional neural network as a shallow neural network and also a deep neural network. Uh, first of all, we have a convolutional layer that is uh, applying some filters like the matrix uh, on the, for example, image. Then we have a, a real layer uh, Rectified linear unit is like the activation function in the yeah, standard neural network, but instead of uh, sigmoid or tangent hyperbolic, we use the li linear uh, function. And uh, the good thing about it is that uh, we, uh, we don't have, we would not have a vanishing gradient problem because the gradient would not be very small. After that, we will have a pooling layer, uh, which is like uh, dimensionality re reduction. And uh, finally, fully connected layer. Again, uh, after fully connected layer, we will have uh, labeled our labels uh, to uh, map uh, whatever neural network uh, has learned as a feature to the, uh, to the label. It is supervised and it needs large amount of labeled data for training. Um, it is uh, very easy to understand how a uh, convolutional neural network works for image recognition, but not for uh, NLP. But it uh, um, works well for NLP also. So it uh, performs quite well. Although we don't have any nice intuition that uh, we have for image recognition, uh, 
Peer-reviews uh, convolutional neural network for NL uh, NLP for sentiment analysis and also classification. It can be used for uh, both word level and character level. Uh, character level is very attractive for user generated content, uh, con content because uh, it, it would, uh, it's not related to the words, so it can tolerate typos and new vocab vocabularies better. And we can use it uh, directly on the character level input or using the autoencoders uh, that uh, we introduced before for uh, using the character embeddings. If uh, we want to use it uh, for uh, on the character level input uh, directly, we will need uh, millions of examples. So the, uh, one of the good points uh, points of using the word embedding or character embedding is that we have uh, used uh, we have learned on unsupervised unsupervised data before, so uh, the learning would be for the learning we would need. Uh, less uh, labeled data. Uh, recurrent neural network, so far uh, whatever we had was a uh, feed-forward neural network, but it is not feed-forward. Feed uh, it means that uh, the output uh, will go back to the input again as a feedback. It is very uh, useful uh, when you have a sequence of values as in input or sequence of values as input as output. Uh, and we can uh, again uh, stack them on top of each other to uh, to build a deep recurrent neural network. Uh, in terms of neural network, we will, we should learn U, W, and V in, for each step. And uh, it is extremely difficult to train because. Uh, it's, uh, the vanishing gradient problem is uh, exponential because uh, yeah. recurrent neural network with n time steps is like uh, multi layer perceptor one with, <coughs> with n layers. So the solution is long short term memory and GRU. Uh, it's, uh, it is like this. Uh, the neural network will decide uh, when to for forget something and when to rem remember it for the future time steps. Mm. The intuition is like this, and the recurrent neural network are, are very good for time series analysis because uh, they can capture the sequence very well and machine translation again uh, because of the sequence. And uh, for one, one input, we can have more than. Uh, one output, the, se the sequence of output, and uh, for text processing also in word level and both word level and character level. Uh, recursive neural tensor networks are also uh, introduced by Richard uh, Sacker. They are very uh, useful for uh, deep, uh, for NLP. Uh, the lib group here is the input. And the root group. What is, is sentiment tree bank? For sentiment analysis. What is sentiment tree bank? Uh, sentiment tree bank is the data set of uh, sentiment for uh, words. So uh, they have uh, manually uh, labeled the words for the degree of their sentiment. Whether they are. Are we using it in Twitter? Actually, it is. It is the stand for the session. Hmm? About the it is part of coronary. It is part of coronary. Yeah. Uh, and the good thing about the recursive neural transfer networks that, uh, is that they, they will capture the syntax uh, very well. For example, here in this uh, sentence, uh, this field doesn't care about cleverness, wit, or any other kind of kind of intelligent humor. It, it is full of uh, positive words, but uh, as you see, the result is negative because it can capture the negativity very well. Uh, and it is uh, like this. Uh, the neural network is the recursive, 
and uh, it will uh, generate all the parsing trees uh, that are uh, uh, that are uh, that uh, we may have and uh, in each uh, root uh, node we will have one S score and one class. The class is whether it is positive, negative or neutral and the S score is the possibility of having uh, this software. And uh, finally it will uh, learn the best uh, tree and also the uh, label. So I guess after our testing uh, we found that Alchemy API output promises. Right? Yeah. And the code of this is actually open source, so if you want to uh, incorporate it in the process, you can do so. Uh, yeah, and uh, we can also train it, uh, t train that with uh, our data set. Because uh, one of the problems that the result is not good because it is trained on uh, product Maybe. reviews, so if we train it on uh, Tweets, maybe the result would be very good because the precision, if I mistake, is 85%. I do ask that so for the precision now, instead of alchemy, they use this one. No, Uh, and the last thing, uh, as Dr. Sheff uh, mentioned, uh, these are based, based on the statistical, uh, as, these are only the statistical methods that are re relevant to the to our data sets. So, so for example, if uh, this re recursive uh, neural tensor network is very successful for sentiment analysis, but when we change our data set, it will not uh, work that, that much well. So for the um, applications, that background knowledge is very important. We should uh, also fit background knowledge to the data set, especially when we don't have uh, enough instances of one uh, concept in the data set. Any question? Uh, how do you work with the strike test, supervised, and then unsupervised means only in the training type of work that you get and learn from that? Uh, traditional classifier, uh, neural networks are mostly super. But uh, these days in uh, neural net, uh, in the deep learning, most of the time is like this. We have a pre-training. Uh, that is uh, um, extracting some features from the unsupervised data, and then we will we will uh, feed some uh, labeled data that is uh, smaller to the data set, and uh, we will train again in the fine tuning step. That is mapping the feature to the label. So in the pre-training, it has learned some features from the unsupervised data, but in the fine-tuning, that is uh, uh, with the various one set of data, uh, we will learn the labels. So may maybe we can call it semi-supervised. But... Uh, uh, still, deep convolutional neural networks are supervised and they require a very large data. So, we've seen, you know, neural network uh, being used for a um, number of things here, uh, labeling, annotations, um, recognition of images, uh, speech recognition, uh, sentiment. Uh, what would we... Is there any challenge it would have, or is it just a trivial task to use it for understanding the intent? Understanding the intent? Like what Ashutosh did the work, right, of intent. Would that be another step forward? Uh, could we take up that work? Or could we use uh, deep learning technique for intent mining or intent uh, identifying intent of the text? So, uh, as far uh, as you can... Uh, the data, it should be a lesson. Hmm? The data, 
Like for Richard Sucker, the Stan Fortin, they annotate in 40,000 uh, words, yeah? So the problem with some kind of a study like intense mining, you have to annotate lots of data. Hmm. Like for the, I think for sentence, 40,000, they annotate. Hmm. As far as you see the problem as a classification, hmm. you can apply in uh, you can apply deep learning on anything. It is but a classification yeah. problem, so in yeah. theory you can, right? Yeah, we can. But uh, hmm. whether the result would be very good or it is very challenging task for uh, deep learning, it depends on the data set and uh, how large it is and how yeah. It can capture different situations. What do you mean by intent? Because when I when I think about the intent problem, it's the combination of the explicit content of a sentence with the context. That's the thing that makes intent analysis so difficult. That's what's giving us grief on harassment, is that you don't have a representation of the of the context in order to to discern the intent. At least for me, the issue was, you know, Ashutosh, uh, you know, his thesis, uh, you know, significant part of it dealt with intent. Mm -hmm. So in query log, when the user searches for something in health, there's an intent, like for it to find okay. a medical me me medication or to find diagnostic techniques or to find, and and um, he, uh, what he did was to actually have user focus group to come up with the intent vocabulary. So there is a specific vocabulary. And then he does that, you know, at least sort of as a classification topic in short sentences. So, uh, actually, deep learning is uh, actually intending to capture uh, more abstract representation of data. So, the question is that uh, does it need to define a higher actually? Abstract features or with the lower features? Uh, we don't uh, define any feature. So, uh, feature extraction, yeah, just we, we fit the data. And, uh, and doesn't need any extra resources, for instance? Uh, any design? Mm, no. no. Uh, no. Of course, for feeding the background knowledge would uh, help, but I don't know. Now, how can I didn't read any paper related to that? But I mean, uh, you know, very abstractly, I mean, they think of neural nets as just implementing some function. So, if, if let's say x f of x is a function, so you give a bunch of sample points and then it will uh, learn the weights and then you ask on other points and it will predict the value. I mean, abstractly, that's what it is doing. But and, and so the way the uh, the filling the gap kind of thing is working is uh, that two things which have similar context seem to map to the same uh, representation in that process. Okay, because for instance, an image might contain an animal and a human, mm -hmm. so doesn't need actually any. Definition for X learning, definition for what the human looks like, what the animal looks like. No, the main point yeah, of yeah. deep learning is, uh, sorry, is that uh, you will not uh, give any feature to the, you will not decide about any feature for the deep learning system. So, in the traditional classifier, we will decide, for example, whether edge, contour, what, what is the discriminating feature for this classification task? But in deep learning, you, you will only fit the deep learning system with the instances and your uh, data set is uh, as large as the deep learning system because of many layers can capture the differences. So, one of the main points is that a human will not extract the feature. So, it's only the power of this huge corpus, which enables the learning and algorithm performance. Um, 
assigned to him during the rest of uh, something related to what Salter wrote up. So, where do position Shoto in Kodo? As supervised or unsupervised? Shoto in Kodo. Where would you position Shoto in Kodo? Auto encoders are unsupervised. Mm-hmm. But we can use them again. Uh, uh, we can use auto encoders for pre training <coughs> and use again fine tuning with supervised data set with the labels. So, it's okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you.